Kia ora. In this video we're going to extend our idea about velocity and we're going to talk about instantaneous velocity, which is the velocity at a particular moment in time. So the instantaneous velocity, uh, we write it in a couple of different ways. We either write it as a vector, v, or if you're in one dimension you might write it as v, or v of t. These are 1d, we sometimes, remember how we sometimes drop the bold notation when we're working in one dimension. Uh, but notice we don't have that average subscript anymore, so we just want to know what uh, the, the velocity is at a particular instant in time. This is like if you're driving your car and you glance down at the speedo, it tells you how fast you're going right then and there. It's not working out an average, it's working, it's telling you the, the speed at that particular moment. So it is a vector, uh, which means it has a magnitude, and the magnitude is called the speed, which we sometimes call s, um, which is a scalar, and it's measured in meters per second. So when we have two different motions, say in two different directions, they can both have the same speed, because the speed is just a positive number indicating how fast you're going. Um, and it is the magnitude of the velocity vector. So in one dimension, um, the speed is just going to be the velocity, but with any negative signs taken out. Okay, so here we just have um, a couple of examples of some velocity vectors. We often, if we're sort of trying to illustrate a, a scenario, we might draw the velocity vector starting from the object in question. So here we have two, two different objects moving at different velocities. So carrots is moving to the right, um, and you can see that Carrots' arrow is a bit shorter, so her speed is less than her horse, which is because the arrow is pointing left, uh, you can tell that the horse is going that way, and it's going to have a slightly faster velocity because the arrow is longer. Um, the scale is kind of just relative here because velocities are measured in meters per second, not meters, so that doesn't really match up with the uh, position axis, but you can kind of tell the relative size of these things by looking at the arrows. Okay, so let's have a look at how we might actually measure the instantaneous velocity of something. So, what do we know so far? We know that if we've got a graph, we know that um, velocity is constant if it's a straight line. So you're imagining your, your ob object is moving at a consistent speed, if line is straight. Um, and that velocity is equal to delta x over delta t, or rise over the run. And that is going to be the same velocity at all these different points along my line. They're all going to be the same because it's straight. And that's kind of what we know so far about how velocities work. So what if we have a, uh, have the situation where instead we want to calculate the velocity at a single point in time? Here we've got a position time graph where the it's not um, a straight line anymore. It's curved. And so we can work our average velocities by taking two different points. But we want to, for example, be able to answer the question, what is the velocity at, say, t equals 50 seconds? How would we do that? Well, the process is quite straightforward. Um, what we do is we zoom in on our graph. And when we zoom right in, you can kind of see that the curve becomes a straight line. If you, look, if you zoom in close enough, it's a straight line. And so we could work out the average velocity for this straight line here using our rise over run technique. And we know that the velocity is the same at all points of that line, and so that would mean the velocity at my instant of time in question, at 50 seconds, would be the rise of a run of that straight line. The problem is, these two points, the endpoints of this line I'm drawing, are really, really close together, and it's going to be hard to read them off our graph with any accuracy. But, because it's now a straight line, there's nothing to stop us zooming back out again and extending that line larger. And what I can do is I can work out the rise of a run for that whole line, and that's going to give me the velocity for my overall graph. So I can work that out. I can see that my velocity at fifth time equals 50 seconds is going to be delta x over delta t for my green line, which is going to be my final position minus my initial position divided by my final time minus my initial time for that line. Let's put some things in. So my final position is 12. Notice this line is going downwards, so we should be getting a negative number out here. And my initial position is 52 meters, divided by, let's see, 100 minus 10 seconds. 
So that is going to be negative 40 over 90 meters per second, which is around about negative 0.44 meters per second. So we could look at the graph and we can see that its tangent line, which is that green line, is sloping downwards, so it's negative, and we can work out the slope of that tangent line, and that tells us what the velocity is at that point in time. So in principle, we can do this anywhere on our graph. If we want to find the velocity at 20 seconds, we could draw a tangent line there, work out the rise of the run for that, uh, etc, etc. And you could collect these velocities at all the different points in time by essentially doing this procedure over and over again. Um, that's how we work out the velocity from a position time graph. So you might remember our position time graph from a couple of videos back. Now what I've done is I've basically created a second graph which calculates the velocity at every point at our position, position time graph. For, so for example at 1.5 seconds, where my mouse is here, I could read up to this graph and I could see that the velocity is a little bit under 2 meters per second. And as we expect, when we have constant velocity, that corresponds to basically a horizontal flat line across here. So let's just play the animation and see what it looks like. So you can see when we're going to the right, we have a constant positive velocity. When we're going to the left, we've got a constant negative one. If we're going to the right, a little bit, well, same as before. And now we're going left again, so it's negative and right again and then you can see when, at the end when we're standing still that corresponds to once again a constant velocity but this time of zero. Okay so here I've set up another example um, this time we have something that sort of behaves a bit more smoothly um, and let's have a little bit of a look about a look at what this looks like so we've got the velocity time graph again along the top position time graph along the bottom when I hit play, you can see, so let's just, for example, focus on that first bit where the velocity is positive. So this is just our zero line. You can see for this section between about two and about four seconds, our velocity is positive, it's above the axis, and that corresponds to movement to the right for that whole period. And then when that crosses the line, when the velocity crosses the line, that corresponds to basically our object stopping moving. So the velocity time graph is crossing zero, whereas the position time graph is flat. And so that's true every time. Every time the position time graph is flat, there's another example here, that corresponds to the points where the velocity time graph crosses the axis. So we'll do, find one more. Here again, it's flat. So our object stopped moving, it's turning around, um, and that corresponds to points of zero velocity. And you can see whenever the velocity is negative, whenever it's below this axis up here, that corresponds to motion to the left. And whenever it's above the axis, like this section here, that corresponds to motion to the right. So let's just let that play out again. Obviously we're going quite slowly now, but for larger values of velocity, like at the start, that corresponds to faster movements. And then this is a, a motion that's sort of settling down over time as Carrots tries to figure out where, where she's going. There we go, zero crossing of velocity, standing still of motion. And as the velocity gets closer to zero, that's closer and closer to our motion just being stationary. So at this point here, we're near zero, so we're not moving very much. All right, so that concludes our chat about instantaneous velocity. We'll see you next time. Kakite ano.